Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I want to start this episode at the very beginning of everything. I mean, I want to start this episode the way everybody starts. I love that moment when you see uh, a mother or family meet their newborn for the very first time. After all these months of in- anticipation, um, I continue to find it to be one of the most moving things I have ever been lucky enough to be at present for. This is Dr. Mary-Kate Hatton. I, it's such an honor to be there. Um, it will never get old for me. Mary-Kate is a family medicine physician who practices obstetrics at Concord Hospital in New Hampshire. She cares for pregnant mothers, she delivers babies, and ideally, she becomes that baby's doctor once they enter the world. I think most people are amazed that, in the end, the most important part is when you actually meet your baby. Um, And sometimes I think those moments when you first realize, oh my goodness, there's this whole baby I need to take care of, I think sometimes that can be surprising. So, Nick, you have experienced this moment twice, the birth of a new baby. Did did you feel like instinct kicked in or were you a little? Absolutely terrified. (laughs) I couldn't I couldn't believe they let me take it home. It. (laughs) I couldn't believe they let me take it home in the car after he was born. So you had no idea what to do. I'd read a lot of books. I had a lot of people's advice. But when it's the real thing, yeah, I didn't know what to do. Well, luckily, even if you are one of the many parents who don't immediately know what to do with this tiny human you're responsible for, there are systems in place to make sure that that baby gets off on the right foot. Mary-Kate made clear that there are plenty of ways to have a baby in the U.S., but best practices dictate important steps for doctors and nurses to take. So after a baby is delivered, we're immediately making sure that the baby is breathing, that the baby has nice tone and is able to move. We're hoping that the baby cries. Uh, And we check that both at the first minute that a baby's been born and again at five minutes to help give an idea of how the baby is transitioning as it's delivered. I love this idea that this human enters the world and immediately there's this transformation going on because they're adapting to life on the outside and you know, meanwhile, the person or people who brought this child into the world, they are adapting too. My role as your physician is to make sure I tell you the up-to-date guidelines and recommendations and to tell you um, what we consider to be safest practice and how to keep your baby thriving and healthy. But ultimately, we're a team and parents know what's important for their child. And I trust parents' instinct. And while I can advise them medically on things, I also trust that they love that child and that they're going to work with me to let them know what's working and where they need more support and for things that maybe not be working for them. So doctors like Mary-Kate are going to make sure that the baby is eating, trying to coach the mother through breast or bottle feedings, monitoring for jaundice and weight gain, making sure the parents have a car seat, making sure that that baby can breathe in that car seat. And if this baby is born in America, well, there are a lot of other gears that start to grind. But before we pull back the curtain on starting your life in the United States, care to introduce yourself, my fellow American? I'm Nick Capodice. And I'm Hannah McCarthy. And today kicks off the first in our six-part series on bureaucracy and you. Our civics ourselves, if you will. It's the way that government, that law, that institutions interact with you, mold you, shape you, control you, and help you over the course of your lifetime. From birth to death. And today we're going brass tacks, absolute basics, the facts of American life before you've lived very much life at all. Facts like, I can't name my baby the exclamation mark symbol. Actually, naming laws vary from state to state, so that's kind of a case-by-case basis kind of thing. And anyway, the name 
is not nearly as important to being an American as the circumstances of your birth. So where you're born and who your parents are? Exactly. And it may sound obvious, but those facts mean everything in the U.S. So this goes back to the 14th Amendment. Say hello to Mr. Dan Casino, professor of political science at Fairleigh Dickinson University. He is also a generous repeat guest on the show. The Reconstruction period after the Civil War ended up defining citizenship because we changed the Constitution in a really major way back then. The Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And these are there in order to try and protect the rights of freed slaves in the southern states and make sure the southern states treat everyone equally because obviously they didn't want to. That's why we had a civil war. How do the Reconstruction Amendments apply to babies being born today? Those amendments were designed to treat a very specific problem, right? They were. But in fixing that problem, we changed something huge. After the emancipation of thousands of enslaved people, there was this problem. These people had been counted as three-fifths of a person before the Reconstruction Amendments, but they were not citizens. They didn't have any rights. Then Congress passes an amendment saying, OK, slavery is now illegal. So we've got a bunch of free Americans. They're citizens, right? So we, the state of Georgia, get to decide who's a citizen of Georgia and who's not a citizen of Georgia. And we're going to give certain rights to citizens of Georgia that we don't give to non-citizens of Georgia. Why does that matter? The fear was, after the uh, emancipation of the slaves, the state of Georgia was going to decide, all those newly freed African Americans, well, they might be federal citizens, but they're not citizens of Georgia, so we don't have to give them any rights under the state constitution of Georgia. So the 14th Amendment is trying to get rid of that possibility. The 14th Amendment shows up to say, look, everybody who was born in the United States is a citizen of both the United States generally and the state in which they reside. So before that, what made you a citizen? That was actually up to the states, which is why there was that risk that pro-slavery states would deny citizenship to newly freed people. But after the 14th Amendment, if you're born here, you're a citizen. So this is birthright citizenship, right? Is that what we call it? Exactly. Citizenship is your birthright if you're born on American soil. Or to American parents. For the most part, there are some exceptions having to do with how long your American parent resided in the U.S. or was working for the U.S. abroad. Also, Nick, here's a wacky one. A person is a citizen if they are of, quote, unknown parentage, found in the U.S. under the age of five, and if nobody can prove they were born elsewhere before they reach the age of 21. How often does that happen? How many people achieve citizenship that way? It sounds almost Dickensian. But so it sounds like your very best bet is being born on U.S. soil. Yes, but that is an aspect of birthright citizenship that people debate heavily uh, because there are a lot of people who feel like non-citizens use birth on U.S. soil as a way to, like, game the system. Well, because it means that if you are not a citizen and you show up in the United States and you have a baby, that baby is a citizen. And there's nothing anyone can do about that as long as they're born in the United States. And this has led to a growth of what's called birth tourism in the United States, where well here foreigners from around the world come to the United States uh, and set up in birthing suites at hospitals in major cities and give birth there in order to give their child a chance at uh, American citizenship when that child becomes an adult. All right, but to be clear, it isn't actually gaming the system. It's the law. It's totally legal. And right now in the U.S., babies born here get U.S. citizenship. Yes, except for the babies of foreign diplomats. There's this clause in the 14th Amendment that says you're a citizen if you're born in the U.S. and, quote, subject to the jurisdiction thereof. But foreign diplomats are not subject to U.S. courts or authorities. They have diplomatic immunity. All right, so not subject to the jurisdiction thereof equals not a citizen. But if we're looking at a non-diplomat's baby born on American soil, we are looking at an American baby, even though people argue about that. Correct. Like being swaddled in an American flag. Or like, have you ever played The Sims? A little bit. You know that green diamond that floats (laughs) over their heads? What's that called? It's called the plumb bob. An American plumb bob. An American plumb bob. Floating over your head. (laughs) Except your plumb bob is invisible. Because, you know, yeah, you've got citizenship, but, but you can't actually enjoy it until someone makes it official. 
So you can be a U.S. citizen but not actually get any of the benefits of being a U.S. citizen? Right, because how can I know that you're really a citizen? I mean, I got to have it in writing. When you're born, the first thing you have to do is register the birth with the government. You have to let the government know that someone has been born here and generate a birth certificate from that. And that birth certificate is a legal document. It's kind of like if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody hear it? Right. In this case, if no one writes it down, authorizes it, the question is, did it really happen? So if you have no birth certificate and you are not white, you are much more vulnerable. This is Susan Pearson. She's a history professor at Northwestern University, and she's working on a book about birth registration in the U.S. Right. You are vulnerable if something goes wrong, if you're picked up by the police to deportation. Although we have near universal birth registration in the U.S., the more on the margins you are, the less likely you are to have your birth registered. Wait, so she's talking about American citizens getting deported? Does that happen? It's actually estimated that thousands of Americans are detained or deported every year in the U.S. And you're vulnerable enough just having a certain last name or looking a certain way. But if on top of all that, your American birth was never registered, you are in real trouble. How do you prove that you're a citizen? There's this pretty well-known story of a young woman in Texas whose birth was unregistered and who had very few official records of her life. My name is Alicia Faith Pennington, and I am a U.S. citizen by birth. However, I was born at home, and my parents neglected to file a birth certificate or a birth record of any kind. They also never got me a social security number. Now, in Alicia's case, immigration is not exactly breathing down her neck. She is a white woman. However, she can't get a passport. She can't get a driver's license. Her home state of Texas, as a result of her case, ended up passing a law which basically made it a criminal offense for parents not to register their children's birth. All right. For some people, there's this threat of deportation and they're not able to get a passport, a driver's license or a Social Security card. Also, think about all of the other inconveniences that could crop up. A birth certificate doesn't just prove that you're a citizen. It proves your age. And think about all of the age restrictions in the U.S. At 16, you can go to adult prison. At 18, you can vote. At 21, you can drink. At 35, you can run for president. Without your birth certificate, legally speaking, you do not have an age. But if you go back even 100 years in the U.S., the whole age thing is not as big of a deal. A lot of people in the 19th century and even into the 20th century actually didn't know exactly how old they were and didn't actually know exactly what their birthdays were or what their children's birthdays were. Or if you did bother to make note of your child's birth, it was probably in the family Bible, or maybe your church took note of the day when your baby was baptized. But it wasn't exactly an official document. Right, but what about the president thing? You have to be 35 years old. That's in the original Constitution. And aren't there age requirements for senators and reps and that sort of stuff? There are. But then again, when the framers wrote the Constitution, they weren't expecting anyone other than wealthy, white literate, landed gentry to end up in office. And at the time, if anyone was having their birth recorded, it was those upper-class people. So possessing the knowledge of your age is like de facto privilege of its own back in the day. Like, the framers all probably knew their own birthdays. Right. And then the cobbler, let's say, who made James Madison shoes, he might be able to estimate his age based on family lore and rough dates. It's like the further away you get from privilege and power the further you get from that specific birthday. Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist and escaped slave, begins his autobiography by saying that he doesn't know when he was born and that slave owners kept this information from their slaves and that this was, for him, evidence of the way that African Americans under slavery were treated like chattel, like animals, right, and not like human beings. But in reality, a lot of plantation owners actually did keep records of the births and deaths of their slaves. So 
even though not really knowing your age was not uncommon, there is something special about age, even in the early United States. Withholding birthdays, even when they knew exactly when an enslaved person was born, was a way for slave owners to further strip that enslaved person of identity and power and access. Because age does have this elevated status in our Constitution. Voting, serving in elective office, serving on a jury, those kinds of things that um, we understand as being sort of primary ways that we would distinguish a, a democracy from another kind of form of government, those are actually all bounded by age. Even before there's birth registration and therefore a really easy way for people to show how old they are, we already have rules about what you can and can't do as a citizen based on your age. Right. I'm thinking about today, and we often use age as this marker for what you can't do. Like you can't get married or drive a car or work most jobs if you're under a certain age. When did that all start? Child labor laws start getting passed. Again, this starts in New England like birth registration does. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, as soon as you start having really factory labor, and, you know, the factories of the mid-19th century are not the factories of the 20th century, but people start to get a little worried about, you know, is it good for their bodies to be in these more dangerous working environments? So we started to look at little kids working in mills and being horribly injured, and we started to think, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't let those little kids work in those mills. But change came slowly. I mean, most of the earliest child labor laws had no provisions for proof of age in them at all. It would just say something like, you know, you can't work in the cotton mill unless you're over the age of 14. And so people would just show up and whoever's doing the hiring at the mill would say, well, how old are you? And you'd say, I'm 14. You'd say whatever the law said, right? I mean, it might be true or it might not. And uh, they'd say, OK. That, that makes no sense. What if you have a particularly tall or strong 11-year-old and mom and dad aren't quite sure how old they are, so they might as well say 14 so the kid can get to work? Exactly. That's the problem. That age requirement is all well and good, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't actually know how old you are. Or if people can fudge the numbers, which they do. And that's around the time the National Child Labor Committee starts ramping things up. And they think that a lot of children are working underage in factories, right? And so they press states to pass laws that are a little more stringent, that have some kind of enforcement mechanism, that have some kind of system where instead of just walking into the factory's hiring office and saying, OK, I'm here, and the supervisor being like, great, you know, here's a broom, go sweep the floor, they want to say that the child has to present some kind of proof of their age. And in most places, this is an affidavit of age, which is supplied by going to a local notary public. Close to a birth certificate, but no cigar. It ends up being basically the same situation as before. Mom and dad can just say little Janie is 14. But then there was this big investigation in 1895 in New York City done by the state legislature, there was a widespread feeling among, again, child labor opponents that this function was no better than parents walking into employment offices with their kids, right? Because notaries are getting paid for performing this service. They don't care. They're not law enforcement officers. They want to get their 25 cents. And their view of their job is... I don't decide the truth. I just certify that a person said this to me, right? So there's this big expose of the notary system and child labor opponents really begin to press for what they call documentary proof of age. I love a good expose. They get things done. Yeah, and this one is no exception. Child labor opponents took a long, hard look at the system and they decided that they knew what to do. There's only one way to ensure an accurate age for a kid. A baby must be registered when they are born. And in a narrow window, too. Could be three days. It could be 
three months, but the point is that there's no incentive for anyone to lie at the time that a birth is registered, right? You're not thinking, well, you know, 12 years from now, I'm going to want to say that Janie is 14 and not 12, right? The other thing about birth registration laws is that in most places, they make the duty to report the birth the job of the birth attendant. This system isn't perfect, right? For example, there were a lot of immigrants coming to the U.S. at this time, and they were out of luck when it came to proving their age. And the race listed on a birth certificate was a weapon in the hands of those who sought to disenfranchise people of color in the U.S. But ultimately, we did get to nearly 100 percent of births being registered in this country. Nearly, but that nearly kind of trips me up. Because at this point in American history, that birth certificate is the golden ticket, right? I mean, not only does it help keep you safe from deportation, it also helps get you a license, passport, register for school, get married, get a social security card. Yes. Also, by the way, the social security card, that is another big one in terms of ID in the U.S. And so there's this box you can check off when you get your birth certificate and the Social Security Administration will send you one. But if you miss that boat, you end up having to prove your citizenship in another way to get a delayed social. Sometimes a religious or hospital record is enough, but that can be a real catch-22. Okay, so do we have a right to a birth certificate? Like, are my rights being violated if my parents don't register me? I mean, it's it's so basic to be able to establish who you are, right? And so for parents to deny that to children, it comes to be seen as almost as criminal. And um, in fact, the UN has a Charter of Children's Rights, which was passed in 1938. Yeah, but that's the UN, I mean, it's not our Constitution. Well, no, this is actually a state's thing. So all states have some kind of language in their statutes that requires a physician, midwife, parent, or some other person present at a birth to register the birth of that child, usually within five to ten days. In some cases, if a doctor or midwife fails to do this, they can have their license suspended until they register that baby. But there are still people who don't register their child's birth for other reasons. They're part of the sovereign citizen movement, right? And and they, they're they people who see and have a kind of very libertarian view, right, that who see registering your birth as a form of submission to the state that is illegitimate and that is giving up a piece of your autonomy and a piece of your sovereignty. It's not just disenfranchised or marginalized or poor or rural populations that may be susceptible to not receiving a birth certificate. There are people out there who say, look, you can't make me submit to the government and you can't make me force my child to do that either. But some of these kids do grow up wanting a birth certificate for various reasons. They might want to get a legal job or travel, for instance. But it's much harder to prove where and when you were born when you're 18 years old. It's amazing to me that this piece of paper, this hallmark of boring bureaucracy, is like the key to the whole city. But what do you get for that? If the birth certificate is the key to protections and privileges, what are those protections and privileges? Like right out the gate? What do you get the minute you come wailing into this world? Yeah. Okay, day one. You're a brand new person here in the U.S. What does that make you in the eyes of the Constitution? Children have rights as citizens of the United States. um, And then they have some rights um, even when they're not citizens of the United States based on case law or statutory law um, rather than constitutional law. This is Sue Mangold, Chief Executive Officer of the Juvenile Law Center. It's a nonprofit that advocates for the rights of children in the U.S. So usually when you try to understand the constitutional rights of children, you begin with a series of Supreme Court decisions, Meyer, Prince, Pierce, Yoder. The interesting thing about these cases is that they weren't actually brought on behalf of the children. They're about what and how a teacher can teach or how a parent or guardian raises a child. Because when it comes to what you get, as this new young person in America, a lot of that has to do with the adults around you. What are their rights when it comes to you? 
They're pretty limited, aren't they? Yes and no. You still have this principle of a parent raising a child as they see fit. This balance between parental rights, children's rights, and states' obligations. And so, you know, there's a whole line of cases around states being able to order medical care, and it's more or less limited to when, you know, the medical care is widely approved and is life-saving. Um, but there's, you know, cases on the margins that don't require quite as high a standard. Um, and in terms of education, parents can educate children at home, they can send them to private schools, they can send them to public school, but there are quite extensive state regulations, even of homeschooling, and so the parents can make choices, but they are limited again. Sue describes this triangle of parents' rights, children's rights, and states' rights. And children's rights have a lot to do with not being abused and not being neglected and also being educated. And the states are the ones who enforce those rights. What if somebody under the age of 18 decides their parent is just not for them? Can they divorce their parents? They can. That would be emancipation. Children seek emancipation all the time. Um, they seek access under a range of laws that give them access to health care and reproductive health care and mental health care and addiction services um, without their parents' consent, mindful that their parents would not consent. But the laws, for all kinds of public health reasons, give the child their own right to seek the services, even if they're well below the age of 18. And again, that depends on the state's laws. like the, the story of children's rights in the U.S. at its simplest is about our understanding children, as hokey as that might sound. Like we went from looking at them as many adults to thinking of childhood as this separate stage of life to thinking maybe that means they shouldn't operate heavy machinery in a mill or get married to finally realizing they need extra defense against abuse and neglect. It's taken hundreds of years, which is funny because people think you're just going to magically know what to do when you have a baby of your own. But as a nation, we still aren't really sure how to raise a kid. No, it's been slow progress. But being born in America, I think, increasingly means that you're being looked out for. And I think there's also an increasing attempt to listen to young people whether that's literally or by looking at their brains and development. And as with all shifts in our democracy, when you give a group a voice, the system starts to respond. Yes, and kids do have a voice, all right. That's actually uh, one basic right we didn't get to in this episode. Yeah, I was kind of thinking that's better suited to an episode about maybe schools. I see where you're going here. That's next time on Civics 101. This was just the beginning. There's a whole lot of life to live here at Civics 101, and we're making our way through those life stages. Next stop, school. And there's a whole lot left to learn, too. You can check out more information about being born in America and all of our upcoming episodes at civics101podcast.org. This episode was produced by me, Hannah McCarthy, with Nick Capodice. Our staff includes Jackie Helbert, Ben Henry, and Daniela Vidal-Ali. Erica Janik is our executive producer. Maureen McMurray really considers herself more of a citizen of the world. Music in this episode by Shaolin Dub, The 126ers, Text Me Records, Hi D, Blue Dot Sessions, Frederick Chopin, and Johannes Brahms. Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Very special thanks to Middlebury College for the generous use of their studio and all of the help of their staff. Civics 101 is a production of New Hampshire Public Radio. Mom and dad can just say little Janie is 14. Janie? <laughs> Mary, Janie, don't you remember me? You know what that is, right? Yeah, that's a good Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to make a boy's camp.
Uh, 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 I wish I wish I had a million dollars. Hot dog. <laughs> <laughs>